Well, welcome to A Day in the Life of a Dispute Resolution Practitioner. I am joined today by Lizanne Eriks and Linda Kahansky. Lizanne is a qualified mediator who specializes in family mediation and workplace mediation. She has a decade of experience in dispute resolution and mediation and has assisted hundreds of clients through the mediation process. Most recently, she was a finalist at the 2019 Australian Law Awards, nominated for Australian Mediator of the Year. She provides ex executive and group coaching and leadership, mediation and negotiation skills at government departments and for corporate clients. And she's also a coach at the College of Law's um, Family Dispute Resolution Program. So Linda, Linda has been admitted as a solicitor in Queensland since 1986, initially specializing in family and criminal law. She gained extensive experience in various areas of law, but discovered a particular interest in family law and mediation. Linda has worked for Relationships Australia in various mediation roles, and she continues to practice mediation and is a member of Bond University's Dispute Resolution Center, on the advisory board of the Australian Mediation Association, and she is secretary for the Mediator Standards Board. In 2018, she won the FDRP of the Year Award, as well as ADR Academic of the Year. Congratulations on that, Linda. <laughs> She's currently practice leader for the College of Law's Dispute Resolution Program, and she also teaches in our Family Law Masters. Yes. So to start, I wanted to start, I'll start with Lizanne, and I want to know how you, so where you got, how you got to where you are now. So where you started and how you got landed at Dispute Resolution. Um, so my background is in law. I studied um, law first and I, um, my first job was as a commercial lawyer. Um, I worked for a big law firm and um, I guess very quickly I realised that that was just not for me. I really enjoyed spending time with people and I didn't really enjoy doing due diligence or looking at contracts for hours and ends. So um, yeah, so I guess I realised uh, very quickly that that's where my interest lied and um, as you can probably hear I'm Dutch from origin so I moved to Australia in 2008 and um, part of the problem was that my law degree, um, you know, it was, it was difficult to, to transfer. So I've already decided that I was not going to um, be a, law, a lawyer any longer. So I completely retrained myself um, in mediation skills. And um, since 2008, that's really all I've been doing because I have nothing against litigation, but I think anything can get resolved in communication and it's a much better way of doing it. Um, so I get a lot more satisfaction from it and so do my clients. So. Yeah, that's how I ended up here. Great. And Linda? Um, a little bit the same, but um, a lot earlier because I'm a lot older than Rosana. <laughs> um, I started uh, my life as a lawyer in a very low socioeconomic area of Queensland called uh, Logan or Woodridge. And I was seeing lots and lots of people with family issues that really weren't legal issues. They were much more holistic. They were much more emotional. And so I... Um, tripped over this thing called mediation, literally. Um, I, get, I entered into mediation, but I still get mixed up with medication and meditation. So that's how long it's been around there. And so as, as you said, Kelly, I got my, um, I fell into a wonderful job at um, Relationships Australia and got trained as a mediator. They didn't have family dispute resolution practitioners back then, we were all called mediators. And um, basically they did that for a while, um, then branched into academia uh, and, basically found my niche as a pracademic for a while working in um, mediation uh, theory but always missed the practice so have come back to that I've still got a private practice uh, but I still believe in training and and wanting to get people I think we have a very hard job but it's also a job that's very fulfilling um, yeah. because we're actually helping people resolve it resolve their issues but they're actually doing it and that's what I found that with court particularly with family matters it just doesn't work. They've got to be parents. They've got to know what's going on. And then I've been lucky enough to fall into the wonderful position I have with College of Law as the practice leader. And I travel around Australia and make new friends like Lasana over in WA and, and uh, lovely coaches in Sydney, etc. cetera. Uh, but still practice. I practice in clinics. I practice um, privately because I think if you train, you have to practice. And so yep. I got there by that way. Oh, thank you. And would you both say that the majority of your work is in family in the family law space, or which which practice areas do you think you, you cover the most? Uh, me or Lasana? Uh, you can go first, and then we'll start. With uh, um, I practice primarily in family, but I um, I did, and I'm going back to doing a lot more workplace ones. And I did wills and estate. I like to say I'm a relationship mediator, 
So I do relationship mediation. I'll do the odd commercial because it's nice and clean and they can go home and never see them again. But um, with the relationship one, it's much more about how people continue or finalising relationships. And I find that really an interesting part of what I do. Oh, and Lizanne, is it for you? Yeah, so it's similar to what Linda said. I also, like I said, I lecture and I teach and I think you're uh, teaching informs your practice and the other way around. And I agree with Linda that the relationships are always the most important thing. So I do a lot of work in a family law space and in workplaces. Um, I don't do a lot of commercial um, mediation either. Like it's, I don't mind doing it if, it come, if I come across it, but that seems to be um, what I do most of. And I think sometimes people think that in workplaces, it's less stressful than with family. But I think people forget that people are at work often more than um, at home. And it is actually, um, you know, really quite intense for people. So it is all about the relationships and the communication and the underlying issues. So that makes it really interesting. Um, yeah, and I just love seeing people resolving their issues. Oh, great. So is it kind of, so do you think that when you walk into mediation, it's, are people usually represented, are there more, is it one lawyer for each side or is it two people and you guys are the third party or what's the, how does it generally work? It really depends. So sometimes we have uh, no lawyer. I have no lawyers in the room. So I have an intake session with people first. So I see them alone. And I do advise people to always have legal advice along the way. So there's always legal advice somewhere. Um, but some people are more than capable to do this without lawyers by themselves. And sometimes um, we do have law I do have lawyers in the room. And so then we have two lawyers and um, two clients in the room. So it depends a little bit about what the situation is like. Yeah. And so Linda, could you take us through kind of for you what a, a day in the life of doing you know, one mediation and what that will look like? Look, well, it depends. A uh, day in the life of me as a mediator, if I'm working for an organisation like Relationships Australia, and, and I, need, I think we need to put that out there. There's a lot of organisation and community mediations and particularly government funded and particularly for people who are wanting to become FDRPs. That's usually where they find their grounding. And I always suggest they go there because they've got the infrastructure, they've got supervision, and it's a really nice nesting. Uh, being a private FDRP, first up, can be a really scary experience because you're out on your limb, you're out on your own. And so that's why. So if I'm working for Relationship Australia, which I do as a consultant, um, if I'm working there, particularly for the Telephone Dispute Resolution Service, I can be sitting there on the telephone doing five hours of contact, meaning that I'll be doing an intake, um, I'll be doing a mediation and, and whatever. If I'm going to do my private practice, that's when I can call my shots about how long I do my mediation. Now, again, it's all very different and I'm only going to say what I do. I like to offer half days. I do four hour to five hour mediations. I just believe anybody after that, they're going to dig their heels in or they're going to give out to move on. I know there's some my colleagues who are uh, legal mediators who start at 10 and they just keep going until whatever time. And I understand that because of resources. But from a mediator's point of view, to get the best out of people, you want to work with them at the optimum. So I do a half, a half day. I'd only do one. I used to do, you know, you can do more than one in a day, but you go a bit gaga and you look a bit funny by the end of it because, it, you know, this is not easy. You're working with people. And I mainly worked with self-represented parties. Um, have moved into represented parties um, in the family law space, but workplace, no, workplace usually is just usually the people and they may have what we call support people with them. So that's a different environment as well. So that's the type of thing that happens in, you know, if, when I'm doing my practice. And so what would you say is the, I know there's no average, what is, how long does the average mediation go for and how many sessions? How long is a piece of string? Now, um, when I practice as a family mediator in Relationships Australia, we said that it would be two to, two to three, three hour sessions to work through issues. And we like to have a break and come back because particularly in family, when you're talking about children, they're not like cans of tomatoes. You have to work out that, you know, what might work on paper will not work in real life. So it's able to trial things. And I think with mediation, because as Lasana picked out that, you know, it's about self-determination, we're sort of there in an educative role as well. So it's nice to touch base. Some legal mediators just don't have that opportunity because it's expensive. Okay, we'll hit you in one day and hopefully it'll work. That's from my perspective anyway. 
Yeah, I think it's very different because I chair conferences, for example, for Legal Aid. So uh, normally those conferences are three hours and that's a funding, it has to do with funding. And I'm sometimes able to stretch it till four. And that, <laughs> yeah, so, but that's about it. And then I have to request to, uh, which is, it's a great program. Um, and that's with lawyers. So, but then I have to request to, uh, to do another session, but Legal Aid will determine if yeah. that's possible or not. So sometimes that does put us under a bit of time pressure because, um, you know, we just don't know if people have another session. So you don't want to leave them hanging, I guess. So uh, those sessions are normally three to four hours. Um, in my private practice, uh, I normally have this similar, like you, uh, Linda, three to four hours when people don't have lawyers. But I do say sometimes um, when I have a lawyer assist mediation, not everyone is available any other time. And people want to do, um, you know, for example, property and parenting. I just gauge how the clients are going. So if everyone's still okay, we have a lunch break and things like that. Sometimes we keep going till later in the afternoon. So it could be a full day. Um, but if people are so, I guess that we have a duty of care to make sure people are okay and can make decisions. So if people are so upset or they can't do it, we'll just have to come back to it. So I sort of played a little bit by ear. Normally what we do with the lawyers and myself, we just put the day aside and then we'll see what happens, if that makes uh, sense. So we have the time to work the clients through whatever they need to work through. Yeah, and it's horses for courses. I think that's the thing that mediation, I think, I know when I train and I talk to people, mediation isn't paint by numbers. There isn't you know, one size doesn't fit all. Because as you're probably hearing, Kelly, it really is, Lasana's picking out, it depends on who you get in the walk, walk in the door. You know, I get self-represented parties who say, I need to have this finished, I want to have this done. So you go for six hours. Whereas you've got other people that you, you see, they're not going to make two because they're just so emotional or what's happening that you need to space it out. So I think mm -hmm. that's the beauty, that's the thing. I think mediators are adaptable beings. We're adaptable and we have to be adaptable. And I, I guess as a mediator, and I don't know if you feel the same, Linda, I, I also have to be mindful of it that because I'm so used to doing all these hours and listening carefully all the time that, and other people, first of all, it's about their life. So it's more stressful, but to be very mindful as a mediator. So if there's mediators listening to this, not to think that the clients have a similar energy than you do, because we are quite uh, used to doing these long hours and sitting and, and working with it. So you always really have to watch your clients and the headspace that they're in. And mind you, I'm not a morning person because I never start my mediation before 10. Because I'm not, no, and I'm being serious here, and I always say that because I know I have colleagues who are minute morning people and they fade. And that's as being a mindful mediator, whereas I'm... That's right. And that's exactly, I'm a morning person. So don't ask me to mediate at eight o'clock at night. I used to do that for Relationships Australia on a Wednesday evening. And at one point I was like... <laughs> <laughs> anyone because I fade out that's exactly right hey we'd be perfect you could do the morning shift I'll do the evening shift and we could get everything done <laughs> so what are some tools that you all use to protect yourselves and also look after your clients and make sure you know there's no stress and you can diffuse situations that might turn ugly um, uh, uh, um well I think the first thing to say about that Kelly is that a good mediator <laughs> will always do a sorry, what we call an intake interview with the parties. And that doesn't matter if you're doing commercial or and under family, it, it's requirement, but under the standards, it should be done for all mediation. And so we get a little sense of what we're facing. And it also helps the parties prepare because if you can imagine if we didn't have something like that and we had Fred and Wilma walking into a mediation room, they knew nothing about it, to, sitting opposite someone they hadn't seen for months on end, they've got disputes, that would be a very stressful situation to begin with. So we appreciate, well, I appreciate that. And so the intake is very much about finding out if it's suitable, but it's also really helping them prepare to come into the room. And that gives us a sense that if it's high conflict or if there's, um, you know, violence or intimidation, we can look at the structure of how we do that. So it's about preparation. And it's also about when we have people in the room, it's just an acknowledgement that we know they're stressed. And it's amazing just using those words. Look, I'm picking up this is really stressful for you. Now, I know it sounds pathetic, but for a lot of people, their shoulders go down and go, oh, my God, somebody knows you. I mean, I've been asked a number of times in recent mediation, are you a mind reader? And it's not yeah. about mind reading uh, in the least. <laughs> it, yeah. It's about that acknowledgement because people are feeling that way and nobody, maybe not even their best friend has said, gee, this must be absolutely awful for you. And a mediator to do that, that can diffuse. I mean, I'm not saying it diffuses all the time because people are going to get angry, but you've got to be able to sit with that anger as well because people have to be able to get that anger out. 
I just yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and to normalize it because I often say things like you know I know this is not the highlight of your week I understand <laughs> And then normally they laugh. So it's also good to, I think, appropriately use a little bit of humor instead, you know, you don't want to do it when it's not appropriate, obviously, but to, um, you know, it's not, it is stressful. And in the intake, like Linda said, we work out how to structure it. Is are people in the room or not? Or have we had more breaks? Or what do people need? And also to build rapport with the mediators. So when people have met me before, they now know, oh, she's all right. I can trust her. So they give me a lot more leeway to work with them. And also I will tell them what I'm expecting of them and what I don't allow and what I do allow. Um, so, you know, if someone is having an opinion about what's going to happen, I'll just make sure that they know that so if it's not the case, that they don't, you know, get angry in a session because they're thinking they're going to, you know, do a particular thing or I'm going to tell the other person off or whatever it might be. So they also know what I can and can't do and what I'm going to do and what I'm expecting of them. And I think that really helps to set that up before you do the mediation and then um, you can just work with your client much better. Yeah, look, I, I, I agree totally. I just wrote a paper la late last year because it had been going around in my head a little while. And what mm -hmm. I think the three, I call it the three A's. Acknowledgement, apology and acceptance. I think people, when they come to mediation, whilst trying to always sort of resolve everything that's going on in their lives, often we'll be looking for one, one, two, or all three of those things. Some sort of acknowledgement, often an apology in terms of that, but often the ability to find acceptance of the situation. And I, I think mediation has that underpinning. You know, yeah, we can talk about the cow, the cat, the dog, the kid, but I think that's underlying. And I think that's a really important role for us as mediators to help the parties find those three A's. Yeah, it sounds like there's a new a baby. Of, <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of personal traits that a mediator must have then, I think, like empathy and what are some traits you think it takes to be a good mediator? You're funny you should say that, Kelly, when my colleague Mika Brandon, who many people will know, wrote the book Mediating with Families, and I were co we used to we were the coordinators at Relationship Australia, and we sat down and we wanted to recruit some new mediators. We sat down, we tried to work out how, what kind of traits and, and skills and things we looked for. We came up with 65. Uh, we thought the selection criteria might be a tad long. but <laughs> <laughs> So I think there is so many because we bring different things. But mm -hmm. I, I tend to think there's, that for me, it's being not judgmental. Yeah, it's being absolutely. serious. And it's a real acceptance of people and an and acceptance of your role as that you're not there to solve the problem. And as a lawyer, that's a really lovely thing to do. So for me, it, you know, yes, it's all, it's my six foot two Swedish friend, last cue, listening, acknowledging, reframing, summary and questioning. But there's also that underneath, that ability to be curious about people, to be compassionate about people and to be caring about people. Yes, no, I agree. I think you just have to really honestly care. And I think the non-judgmental mental thing is really important. As soon as clients no, you're judging them. I mean, we all know what it feels like, right? I've been judged by people and people think that people don't know if you don't say it, but they do. And it doesn't mean as human beings, we don't judge. It happens. It's automatic, but to be able to put it aside and people get in certain situations sometimes and sometimes they make bad decisions, but they're here now and how you're going to help them move forward. Um, and I think listening is really important and listening you know, I think Linda and I both used it with four ears to go, what's not being said and what is underlying and then checking in, not assuming anything and go, so I think you're saying this, but is that actually what you're trying to say? And also observing and being able, I guess I'm fairly, I ask permission from clients, but I'm also don't beat around the bush. Like yesterday I had two clients and I could see how they were communicating. So I said to them, do you mind if I share my observation with you, which I think what is going wrong between the two of you? And they both went, yeah. So they give permission so then you can say it, right? And I just said, well, this is what you're doing and this is what you're doing and that's why it's not working and you're doing it right in front of me. And they were both like, yes, that's it. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? so it's, it's also to be able to call things and not, um, and I do, you're not an authority, but you do need to also be willing to lead the process. You are the person that is guiding it and not be taken on a ride either by either of the clients. So creating a safe space for people to be in so both clients feel safe. Yeah. Um, but I think most people can learn it um, but you have to really put the work in, learn a theory and practice a lot. And some people are naturally better at than others, I would say. I always say with my, when I'm training, particularly baby, new, novice, trainee, whatever word you want to put before the mediator, unless you're convinced and believe in what with the process and what we're doing, don't try to just paint by numbers. 
because mm. as I said, it's, you know, it's, it's an art and a science. The science is the steps and lots of people can learn the steps. But unless you believe or are convinced by the process of mediation, then it's not, you're not going to be, you're not going to do the work, in my opinion. You can't yeah. just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so that's really, and I think, and I also really agree, because I was thinking about it before we jumped on, um, Linda, with you, is that also when you're a new mediator, to go and actually practice and work with people, because if you're going to go out there by yourself, you don't really know what you're doing. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. It's not responsible for the clients, but also why not get paid to learn from someone that's already made all these mistakes? And um, I've learned so much from working for other people and for non yeah. profits and I still continue learning because that's the other thing. I think you have to be curious and want to learn and never think that it's done because it just isn't. It's constantly yeah. evolving and I do training every year and um, yeah, and by facilitating myself, I have to be up to date anyway, but it is, um, I think that's really important and also not thinking and, and practice what you preach, right? Like, I think it has to be authentic. If I have conflict in my life with everyone I meet, I'm not sure how that's going to go. It doesn't mean I never have conflict. Conflict is part of life, but I do take on what I tell my clients to actually apply to myself. I think when, and people can sense authenticity, I think. Yeah, I think the best thing for me was learning from the other coaches that I'd never met before and, and mm -hmm. seeing, and I think that's the, what I try to, that we're a very collegiate profession. I mean, you know, we're, and, and the whole thing is that the other thing that you need to learn is about self, self practice, you know, reflective practice. And as Lasana said, learning from others and finding mentors and people to talk with. Very different to the legal profession where you walk in and the only kind of supervision you get from your supervising partner is how much money did you make this week and how many files you're going to finish next week. Um, the mediation is a much more collegiate and working for a place like Relationships Australia, if I had a difficult mediation, there was always someone to talk with. And I think that's, that that's what you'd have to get because that's the only way you grow and change because no two, no, you know, no two parties are ever the same. And so it doesn't matter, you know, you need to be able to have that toolbox built up. Yeah. Do you think that, is so, especially for a lawyer wanting to move into this space, do you think step one would be to find a mentor? Uh, well, after a good training course, yeah, you have to do it. You have to do a course and then do that first and then uh, get experience like anyone else, because with a lawyer, they will have a lot of background in one area. I think what we often see when we facilitate, Linda, correct me if you disagree with me, but you have people from a social science background and people from a law background. And I'm generalizing here, so I hope no one's going to get offended here. But often the legal profession uh, needs to upskill within the soft skills. And the people who are done counselling have to be careful not to counsel in mediation because it's quite a, we're not counsellors and we're not lawyers. We're sort of this in-between kind of space and uh, brush up a bit on, well, you are working in a legal context and what consequences does that have? So I think, um, yeah, so if you're coming from a law space and you need more so, uh, soft skills, maybe do some extra work around that and then work with someone. I've always, you know, go and pick people that I look up to or I think they do really great or an organization I want to work with. And I still do that. It is every time you find someone else, right? Um, while you grow. And I think you just work with someone. And I think as a lawyer, it's really important. I used to be a lawyer. And as I, again, I have nothing against lawyers. I love working with them, but it's very, very different. And I think sometimes I think people think that mediation is something that anyone can do because it looks so easy, but it actually is a skill set and a profession and to take off your lawyer hat because it is very different. You're not telling people what to do. And people find that very, when we train people, we find it very difficult to put that aside because they're just so used to going, well, just do this and I advise you to do this. And you know, and that you can't do that as a mediator because you'll pick side if you give legal advice. So I think that's of, often the biggest struggle in general for lawyers to be able to sit back and let clients resolve it and trust that your clients know and guide the process instead of driving them to an outcome. Look, I agree totally. Um, I just have two quick points. I think um, everyone that's attracted to mediation is a problem solver, whether they come from the social science background or the legal background. Problem solvers are attracted to mediation, which is great, except what we're trying to do is create the problem solvers being the party. But, and you're right. But I, and, and I think, you know, what you're saying is exactly right, that Mind you, I found some psychologists to be more directive than lawyers, but then I won't. Oh, go I know. Through. So I, I, that's why I said I'm generalizing. Yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm, I'm not, not a the, student psychologist. Yeah. But, no, yeah. and it's it's not the truth, right? But I'm just trying to no, demonstrate. 
something. I have, so a, lot I have of a little yeah. mock uh, when I when I'm starting a mediation course. I do a bit of a visual where I explain that lawyers tend to go the straight path to get to the result, and they'll knock everybody out of the way to get there. Counselors, social workers. They'll go talk to someone and there'll be something really interesting about their mother or their childhood. And they'll go down that rabbit hole and spend, you know, two hours talking about that. We as mediators, we will take the bumps. We will go side to, if we need to, but we still do still have an outcome that we want to look for. But we're not like, you know, it is a skill set because we talk about changing. There's a mindset change. It doesn't matter what professional hat you on. Putting the mediator hat on is very different, particularly if you've been a lawyer for 20 years or a social worker 20 years. We're asking you to put a mediator's hat on. And, you know, I, I, was, a medi I was a lawyer for 10 years. I was a lawyer mediator probably for 15 years. I sort of was a mediator lawyer. And I think I'm now finally a mediator uh, because the transition is not easy. And we'd ask him, I think the other thing, Lasana, if you would agree with me, is that, you know, mindset is one thing, process is another. The big thing for us, and a lot of we get comments when I train, is the language, the mm. language of being a mediator. Um, that it's a really different, is it like, you know, people that come who come, you know, English being their second language goes, oh, I don't know if I'll cope with this. I said, hey, don't worry. Everybody else in the same room is learning a new language as well. Because I think the communication, the language is the thing that makes mediation so special as well. I don't know about what you yeah. but yes. Yeah, and no, definitely it's being able to reframe to, to actually get what people are saying and giving it back to them so they go, oh, yeah, that's it. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, and neutral language, I think that's really hard. Oh, people. that's hard, yeah. Because you're not, you don't want to, you know, neutral language is different than picking a side. It's sometimes easier, I guess. Yes, oh, I totally agree. Can you give us some examples of the neutral language? Um, go ahead, I, you first. <laughs> well, I guess. I guess things is, you know, for example, when you set an agenda and someone goes, um, you know, Johnny has a new girlfriend and her name, I must call her Kelly. Sorry, Kelly. I don't know. <laughs> and so we're talking about Kelly and Kelly is awful and blah, blah, blah. And then I go, so it sounds like we have to talk about new partners. Is that what you want to talk about? And then, so it's neutral. It's, it's for both clients. It's about new partners. What are they going to do with that? It's not about Kelly, you know, so Kelly is for one party. So that's sort of a little example of neutral language. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, the, look, you get the common one, which I, if I had a dollar for every time I heard this, I wouldn't be doing this. I'd be sunning myself somewhere. Uh, you know, I'm not letting, you know, Fred, little George go to see Fred anymore because he feeds him two minute noodles and he came home sunburnt. You know, he's a, he's, a, he's a negligent father and he should not have anything. Now, of course, that's Fred sitting there going, it's not a negligent father. So you need to turn that to something. So, so what I'm hearing from you about that is that you're worried about what, little George is eating when he's in both households. You want to make sure there's some consistency. And you've got a little concern about the safety, uh, well-being of uh, George, particularly around sun safety issues. Would that be right? So, you know, Fred's not going to say no to that because he's going to look like a deadbeat dad if he says no to that. But you, you're also not, you're, you know, it's one of the basic principles of negotiation. You're soft on the people, hard on the issues. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think a lot of our work is making sure that we move it from the person to the issues. Because it's easy, particularly in family, to identify the other parent as the problem. You know, yeah. if Fred jumped off the Story Bridge, which is in Brisbane, that would make all my problems go away. Well, no, it won't. What's yeah. happening is you've got to deal with what's going on underneath. And yeah. so that's the kind of stuff we do is move it from that to that through language, Kelly. Yeah, that's right. And when people like talk about eating, then they can talk about both what they do and they can get on the same page. And all of a sudden it's not about thread. It's about, well, what does Johnny need to eat? Or if the and in particular kids with special needs, it's a whole different ball game. But yeah. you know, so there is um so that's yeah, so neutral language is really important because otherwise you're going to a disadvantage one client and you'll lose them in the process. And and because we say that mediation is about an impartial third party facilitating discussion between the parties. We have to not only be impartial, but be seen to be impartial. And that's through the way we're even handedness, that's through our language, that's through all the things. And touch wood, I've never been accused of, accused of bias in nearly 6,000 hours of mediation. Um, and even though in my head I'm going, really, Fred? Really, Fred? But, you know, that's not going to happen because that you have, that's why the, uh, the discussions always have been, I never use the word neutral because I'm not neutral when I walk into a mediation. No, I have funny. opinions. I, yeah, exactly. We have opinions, we have beliefs, we, you know, but we can act impartially and be seen to be impartial. 
and yeah, I, put, I call it putting it aside. And my clients often ask me if I play poker. Um, I, <laughs> I'm terrible at poker, just for the record. Um, but that's how they experience it, that they can't tell. So I also say to, when I teach people about mediation, I say, you've got to train your face. Because a lot of people think they don't say anything, but they move their face in all sorts of <laughs> directions and the clients will know what you're thinking. But I think it's also, for me, is that I've come to the conclusion that, yes, people, and they, I have come across some very unpleasant people, but I always have in my mind that, you know, even though we're focused on the children and we do that, that we've got damaged adults. These people are in trauma, they're distressed, and people who are traumatized or hurt they react like wounded animals and wounded animals can react really in a, in a number of ways they can come out swinging they can run away or they can be a possum and pretend to be dead so freeze and so i'm very conscious that i'm also dealing with people that are may need assistance as well and so i suppose that's always in the back of my mind as well yeah no i completely agree and neuroscience shows that you actually you know your prefrontal cortex doesn't work for you in conflict so right. actually decision making your lip, memory yeah. is great so everyone turns into a crazy person it includes you and me or anyone else if you're in that state of mind so part of our role is to keep you all calm and out of that state of mind so they can make a proper decision so yeah, that's Dan Siegel calls it flipping the lid yeah uh, it's about having making sure you keep the people because when you flip the lid you go back to what you call your reptilian brain which is just running on survival using all our skills we can close that off and so okay. people can, whilst they're still experiencing it, at least they can move forward. So you yeah. can see, Kelly, there's a lot more than just you do this then and you do that then and you do this. There's a lot of underplaying to become a, a mediator. I, mean, I, think, I think Linda, she's asking us one question and we just rattle on about five hours. Yeah, poor, poor, poor Kelly. She goes, I hope you haven't got too many questions because we're going to be here for no, the <laughs> Well, we're a, bit, we're a bit passionate. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, I'm not so sorry. Well, maybe we can focus on just one mediation. And I know you guys briefly, you said at the beginning about the interview ahead of time. And then just kind of step by step, what's the next step? So you've interviewed both parties. Yes. Before mediation. And what, what's next? Well, then if, they're, if it's suitable for mediation, if the parties are ready for mediation and a whole lot of things. So it can be if you, you know, and particularly depending on, again, if you're working for an organization or privately, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, that's been one of the big criticisms and that's why there's a lot, you know, hopefully getting more mediators and FDRPs to fill a gap, that type of thing. Then, for example, I, you come into the mediation, the mediation would be very structured. Um, you know, with, I call it a nine-step program, which I know there are 12-step programs, but this is only a nine-step. Um, there's every slightly different models for everyone, but the basic uh, synopsis, and Lasana can add in, and is that, you know, you have an opening statement where you put the parties at ease, if you're doing a family one, there are regulations and, and requirements that you have to do. Um, then you ask each party what brings them there. So that allows them time to talk. Uh, you get an agenda up, which is basically, and that's interesting. Agenda is an interesting topic, Kelly, because uh, under the uh, NIMA standards, it can be either questions or topics. And um, going around Australia, I see it's differently. Queensland, we're all over questions. My New oh, South oh, Wales yeah. colleagues do, do not do questions. Uh, yeah. They do tropics. <laughs> and then uh, Victorians a bit, uh, they'll do both. I think Western Australia is a bit more topic, but you've got some questions. It's half half. I just say they want to do what you're good with. I just was not trained with it. And I just, I just questions, I don't know, it just doesn't work for me. Yeah. But, I'm not saying, but I'm not saying it's bad. So I always say to my students, just try what feels natural to you. I don't think it really matters as long as you do it appropriately. Exactly. Way, exactly. But it's quite an amusing thing. So, but the, the, the agenda has to be neutral, mutual, future focused. And if we're doing family, we also throw in being child focused. Then we go into what we call the exploration option generation stage. And this is the hard bit for a lot of people because this is where you literally, we have a saying, you feel the back of your chair and you sit back and the, the purpose is to get the parties talking with each other to discover what's underneath, um, moving them from their wants to their needs. Funny, I'm just doing a PowerPoint for a presentation. I'm coming down to college to do CPD in February and talking about moving from wants to needs because people come in and say, I want this, I want that. But that's their position. They've got to find out what their interests, what their needs are. And we, that's where the past and the present come into it. And then you look at, so you're listening to them to talk 
and what falls out are either options or obstacles. Both are okay, and I say that to my parties because obstacles just mean things that we've got to work around. You, yeah. do that, you do that, and then you go into a private session with each of them, bring them back for negotiation. So that's the sort of big overview that I do. Um, it's generally done the same way. A couple of models chain that you do exploration, but don't do options, and then you do private session before you do options. So there's some minor differences. But the bottom line is, the, 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 for me, the facilitative model of which we teach is that facilitation of the discussion is the key. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, I do sometimes mix things around a little bit at the bottom end. So, it, you know, if a private session is needed, um, just from because I've done it so many times, then I do it whenever I feel the clients need it, if that makes sense. Um, and um, But when I teach, obviously, it's exactly the same as what Lena's saying, because I think you need to master something before you start messing with it, if that makes sense. And you still have to uh, make sure you do the standards, so you have to, you know, comply. Um, I think an exploration should take the longest, because that's where people really going to talk about what really matters to them. And I think what Lena's Linda trying to say, so the position is, you know, I want 50-50 care, and then an interest might be, what we really want to talk about is because that then you have like one option which is 50 50 care right you have nothing else to talk about but then if you get to exploration you could come to an outcome of like i'm just afraid of losing contact okay. with my children and then you have so many different options to actually resolve that issue so that's what exploration is for people to get understanding also sometimes they it's not human you know humanizing again making you know, understanding it's difficult for everyone. So that's normally where I spend most of my time. And that's in training for people the most difficult because it can be uncomfortable because you have no idea where the clients are going. So you have to let them go. Like Linda said, you sit back and you facilitate a little bit, but you don't say that much. And um, yeah, so you have to let go and not want to control the process and then see what happens. And of course you have to keep people in line and it, it can't go everywhere, um, but you just have light touches and then negotiate. And if, an agreement roll, if agreements roll out, then you type them up for the clients or when there's lawyers in the room, they do it for you. So it depends again a little bit where you are, how a process is finished, if you book in a new session straight away or if that's not possible or if you're writing it up. I find um, when lawyers in the room, I don't mind if it gets written up straight away and signed because people have legal advice. In my private practice, when there's no lawyers in the room, I will type it up after and send it out because people don't have legal representations there and then, and I feel uncomfortable with anyone signing something right away so they can go away and think about it. Yeah, but, I agree. Totally. Yeah. What I do say to clients, I was actually just making a video about it, is to, you know, if you're not sure about something, I'd rather have people not commit and think about it than saying, yep, I'm going to do that, and then change their mind because that increases conflict often, and they say, well, mediation was a waste of time and money and not doing this anymore. So, um, yeah, so you're constantly coaching people throughout the whole process. Have private session, make sure they're okay, make sure they want to do what they say they want to do, if they can do it, because sometimes people really would love to do something, but they actually can't. So this is lots of your role as well, reality checking everything. So people can find us mediators challenging because we go, well, so how is that going to work? How are you going to do that? Who's going to pay for that? What time? So at the end of the session, you're getting a bit more like that. And I warn people for that. I say, you know, first, we're just going to explore what the issues are. And then when you make agreements, it has to be an agreement that you can actually do in reality. And for me, that's really important. And then if people don't have lawyers in the room, I talk to them about what are you going to this agreement when you walk out? So they also have a process. So they also have a process. Um, um, so yeah, look, I, I agree totally with all of that. I mean, the reality is that I'm the same in private practice. And when I'm doing my practice, I tell people that I will go to private session at some time during mm. the um, mediation. And so that can mean that I can go early, I can go late, I can go. But when I'm teaching, I again, put some structure yeah. because yeah. Right. boundaries right. are good for people. What is an example of a time where mediation wasn't good from the outset? So during the interview stage, you decided this isn't going to work or where it didn't work in the end. Do you guys have examples of that anecdotally? Uh, you just got to be careful because it's confidential, right? So yeah, <laughs> no names yeah. Exactly. I'm just trying to think of what it can share. Well, sometimes I guess it's unsuitable, particularly when there are um, issues of you know, when there's high levels of domestic violence or child safety issues. So, um, and it's the same in workplace. If there's things, if people, I guess my thing is, if I think mediation is going to harm people, 
more than doesn't does any good, if that makes sense, then I'm not going to do it because why would I put people through that? So I'm, I'm quite, because I, I've been quite experienced now, so I, I'm willing to deal with quite a bit. But if it's really going to re-traumatize people or harm people in a way that I can't manage somehow, because sometimes you can manage those things by having a professional in the room or doing separate rooms or whatever it might be, a phone or video or whatever. Um, but if, you, if, if you're if really going to re-traumatize someone, then I just don't think that is beneficial or if there's child safety issues that I can't, I can't investigate. So I don't want to be involved in making agreements for children that might be unsafe for them. And then someone needs to investigate who can. So these are the kind of things that I will go, you'll have to get the court to deal with that or, you know, Department of Child Protection. Is there, if there's a case open with the Department of Child Protection, I won't mediate until that case is closed or resolved. So we know the outcome. So those are the kind of things that I just, you know, you have to be very careful with. Yeah, look, I agree totally. The, we have a saying on the East Coast, same as yours, do no harm. Yeah. Uh, the parties can't go, can't leave a mediation room worse than they come in, in terms of that. Look, I think the only time things get pear-shaped in a mediation often is when people are keeping secrets and dropping big grenades. Um, you know, the in end, the case, only, last five yeah. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or in private session, do you think there's anything you've got to tell me? <laughs> you're going to go, yes, actually, you go, oh, really? Um, but no, seriously, I mean, the ones that come in my head there years ago is like I had one where we sorted it all out, all this, all the arrangements, and I, but I could sense there was something, you know, as a mediator, as Lasana said, you get to a point where you, your little alarm bells are going off and you don't know why because every... And in private session, I, I, I tackled the, the mother... And she had told me that she had decided she had met someone online and she was moving to Kalgoorlie, actually, from Brisbane uh, in the next six weeks and um, taking the three daughters with her and hadn't brought that up in mediation. And so those kind of things, the unexpected, is that you need, you know, sometimes there are little grenades that you can throw your body on and it goes boom and you can move on. Sometimes they're a bit bigger and you go, oh, Lord, what am I going to do? But look, that doesn't happen often if you've done your prep work. If you've yep. done your intake, you know, this came up between intake. They'd had like three sessions. And so she had fallen in madly in love and was moving in six weeks. You know, literally she fell in love in six weeks. So, you know, things can happen like that. But otherwise, you know, um, it is about sensing about no danger. And I, I think the safety issue is safe for the mediator, safe for the parties, uh, safe for the children. Our duty of care, in my opinion, starts from, you know, getting them to the mediation room, protecting them within the mediation room and getting them home is sort of my kind of duty of care stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's also on me as well. Uh, I, I, there's no, no reason for a mediator to put themselves in any kind of risk or harm. Yeah, and, and what I've had going wrong is when um, I've had clients, it hasn't, again, it hasn't happened often because I've been doing this a long time, but it's, um, when people um, were great in the intake and then um, someone would have taken something um, the night before or wow. sort of on a down from drugs or alcohol intake on the day of mediation. So I could instantly sense or smell that something's off. So, you know, I guess the message would be for any mediators listening to this is that you just have to keep assessing throughout the entire process. And at one point, if you think it's not suitable, because people have to be able to make an informed decision, they have to be uh, in a set, they have to be safe, and that's emotionally safe as well. So then you just can call us. So you can go, this is not happening. Let's well, we've talked a lot about mediation. Um, I wanted to know if you could take me through quickly just the different types of dispute resolution. So we've talked about mediation. You're both FDRPs. Um, Lizanne, could you talk about kind of what an FDRP does and how that kind of differs from normal mediation? Yeah, so when you do normal mediation, I don't really like the word normal because all of that means, but yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. So in mediation, you um, you know, you do the mediation process, but it's, it is for corporate or workplace, um, and it's a similar kind of model to start off with. So when we teach people to be FDRPs, that's what we start with, it's a facilitative model. But when you are an FDRP, a family dispute resolution practitioner, you're going to be registered with the Eternal General's Office and you're specifically dealing with family. So there's a lot more training comes with that because it comes with a different ter territory. So um, you have to learn about domestic violence, about child abuse um, and, and all those kind of things. So, and what we do is we teach people and, and we work with being child focused. So what I often say to clients is say, listen, I'm, I'm you know, impartial between the both of you, but not completely because I'm on the children's side. 
So what I say to my clients, that I'm not an expert on your children. You are because I don't know your kids. But what I do know is I know things around in general developmental stages. Um, I know about, um, you know, I ask. So everything I do in the questions because I don't tell people what to do, but I'll go, uh, you know, what will it be like for Johnny and Mary? So I know that this, you really want this, but what is going to work for them? Because as a parent, your needs don't always match your children's needs. So what Linda was talking about before, someone said, oh, if the other person would just disappear, my life would be better. Well, maybe for you, but not for your children. Or, you know, my kids want to go to the United States, to Disneyland or the other parent. And I find that really scary as a parent to let them go, but it will be a great experience. So you have to uh, coach people to be able to separate those two things. Um, we, they obviously have to be comfortable, but, um, you know, really focusing on the children's needs. So that's very different from a workplace or commercial mediation where it's just about what the person wants or needs itself. So it is a completely different, well, the process is similar, but it is very different because a child focus really comes into it and the safety issues and assessing for suitability and issuing certificates is another thing. So we issue certificates for people to go to court and there's different types of certificates and you need to know what is what, how it works. We work with violence restraining orders. Uh, you know, a lot of my clients have violence restraining orders on each other. How do you work with that? And um, what are the legalities around that? So there is, as you can sense, there's a lot more to that process than uh, the other types of mediations. And can you talk, talk to us a little, a little bit about what a um, 60I certificate is? So that's if you want to go to the family court to, um, you know, get parenting orders because you can't agree the court would not allow you to lodge parenting orders unless you have a certificate like that so unless there is an exception there are exceptions but you know people have to get legal advice about that but the court would like people to mediate because research shows that when people make their own decisions they actually follow them all plus the parents are the experts on their children so you know the court and the court's busy they only want to deal with like really really high level you know high complex matters and for the rest they would like people to organize it themselves so the 60i certificate you can if you know if one party doesn't show up the other party can mediate so then they could go to the court and say i didn't you know, i couldn't attend i wanted to and then the court will deal with that it can be that uh, mediators uh, fbips we say it's not suitable for mediation for all sorts of reasons and then the, then a certificate says that so the court knows that so they will deal with it or um they you know, we say listen it's um, people try to resolve the issues in mediation, but they couldn't. So now please go and deal with it. So the court will deal with it. There's a couple more, but it's just going to be a bit technical to talk about that. So in general, these are the kind of, um, the kind of issues that of the kind of, uh, things we can put on a certificate, but we don't really give much details. They're just lines. So the court doesn't really get much from us. It's just to say A, B, C, D, E, um, which one is it? And then the, and then you can lodge your or, um, your parenting orders, you know, your request to the court with that, and then the court will deal with it. Or sometimes they send you back to mediation if it's a certificate A when the other person didn't show up, but it's up to the magistrate then anyway. Okay. And Linda, could you touch on negotiation? Oh, look, negotiation is basically what we all do, um, whether you're talking about informal or, or formal negotiation. Certainly, um, negotiations are what lawyers do. Um, that's a lot of what they do is the negotiation, whether written or they... And what we actually do as mediators, we, we basically coach our parties to how to negotiate with each other. Um, parties have tried to negotiate, but they just don't have the skills. So we tend to be, and I think Lasana mentioned that, you know, we're coaching them all the way along how to put proposals to each other, counter proposals, reality testing, is that really going to be something? I actually say to my parties, particularly in private session when I'm trying to coach them when they come back to negotiation, is that it is all about negotiation and you want to get the other party to say yes. How do you make the other party say yes to your proposals? And that's vice versa. So negotiation is everywhere. Negotiation is a skill that I think we all should master at some point. Um, yeah. So lawyers do it regularly. Uh, I, I sometimes think the lawyers don't negotiate interest-based because, again, there's interest-based and position-based um, types of negotiation. And it's learning how to be interest-based or principal negotiation makes the, makes the difference because that's when you're looking at more than just what they want, you're looking at their needs again. So that's that kind of thing um, in negotiation. Okay, and the next one I have is conciliation. Okay, conciliation is, well, I mean, we're now on a spectrum. I wrote an article many, many years ago is how long is a piece of string? And that was all about the dispute resolution spectrum. 
because you know you've got one down one end you've got your counseling negotiation and even in mediation we we're not going to discuss it today but we've got facilitative settlement evaluative therapeutic all different types of mediation now up that end is the evaluative mediation and so all that means is less self-determination it's more that and conciliation uses a lot of the skills as a mediator but the conciliator has a right to give an opinion or advice because of their expertise you find a lot of conciliators in places like um uh, the work uh, uh, what is it work fair fair work commission um in places like um on the ombudsman's being health ombudsman or you know transport ombudsman or whatever ombudsman you might they are actually who have expertise when people are coming to disputes uh, there's a lot of conciliators in the aged care commission sector uh, and discrimination so they have expertise they use the skills but they also have a little bit more of a norm and then you move on to people like expert appraisals and then you get down to the arbitration where arbitrators can actually make awards so what it is you're going down the spectrum less the self-determination as you're getting towards the end and then judicial decision which is a dispute resolution process in itself but mm. there's little self-determination that's done by a judge yeah because a conciliator doesn't actually make a decision they do give advice but the party still decide and an arbitration you move up a notch so the arbitrator makes a decision and but they're still a bit more informal and then court is sort of the last yeah like the that's thing I, determination. I agree but the only thing about arbitrators depending on what sector of course they can make awards which are binding yes, so absolutely. they get their point yeah yeah and they're very hard to uh, fight binding awards as well so um and look, you know, I think we're going to find more conciliation coming into a lot of the areas. Um, I know from a Mediator Standards Board, we're looking at that and there's been a lot of research on bringing conciliators under that umbrella of dispute resolution in terms of standards, et cetera. Um, arbitrators to me are a different breed again. We're going down that next step. And then of course you have your judicial decision. I think yeah. the skills and the processes of a mediator can lend to becoming an conciliator but it also can help you in negotiation. So the mediator sits nicely in the middle of all that, in my opinion. Yeah, and Kelly, we're also getting blended processes now. So mediation, arbitration is talked about. So, you know, it's quite a, yeah, um, yeah so we're quite a innovative profession, the whole dispute resolution. So we're all linked somehow, somewhat. So they're looking at doing mediation, arbitration together in a process that it's already happening in other countries. And, you know, there's people against it and not, you know, for it and against it and things like that. So. Yeah, watch this space, I guess. Yeah. Well, I've gotten a lot of questions from people who want who registered for this. Um, one of the main questions we got was, where does one begin to find work in the area? Well, I, I think Linda and I touched on that before. I think if you're new to the industry, go and find, there's a lot of uh, government departments and non-for-profits. So the health department has a conciliation mediation kind of department, Department of Corrective Services here in WA, does victim offender mediation. I've worked for them as well. Relationships Australia, Centre Care, um, Anglicare, they do family mediation. So go and have a look for what kind of dispute resolution um, departments or programs companies run and um, see what, what fits your skill sets or wherever you want to go. And that's where I would start um, because I think, we, yeah, we, you can go out on your own in the first place. But I, because um, I think the next question will be something around how do I get clients? Um, and I always say to people, you need to think about why would someone want to hire you? Put yourself in the position of a client would you hire you if that makes sense so so what is it that and and if there is a gap somewhere so it could be that you're not exposing yourself enough so people don't know you there but it could also be gap and experience then go and close that gap first because otherwise people are not going to hire you anyway so i would suggest do that um and or work for someone that you go they're amazing i would love to be mentored by them and just go and ask you now all you can get is a no you already have that um, because I've asked lots of people to help me on, along my way and sometimes I was so scared to do it. But people are super friendly and they're like, sure, like, great. I didn't, and they are sometimes really humble and like, why are you asking me? I'm like, because I think you're that help and um, yeah, see what happens. Yeah, I look, everything Lasana said, I, I endorse completely. I think too that, you know, there's uh, organizations like Resolution Institute, um, who are RMABs, uh, connecting in with local networking of the mediators. Uh, I can't talk for um, WA, but I know over the East Coast, um, you know, uh, Resolution Institute, who 
I'm not a member, so I'm not promoting them as such, but uh, what I'm saying about them is that they do have chapter meetings, they have interest groups. So the other way is also meeting like-minded. I, mm. I think, you know, what I say to young mediators, oh, how do I get work? Well, what kind of mediation, you know, if you want to do community, go and talk to the community legal centres. They're likely to have the ability to, you know, that a lot of them around Australia have a little bit of a mediation arm. You'd have to do it pro bono, but hey, it's worth a shot. Um, but if you don't know sort of what kind of area and if you're, you know, if you're having, you know, there's some people having a big transition from being like, um, you know, an engineer and decided they want to become a, a commercial mediator, that's going to take a bit of a leap. However, if you've been a family lawyer for a while and you're wanting to do FDRP, it makes more sense. You're adding that string to your bow and you're going to use it. Um, so if you've been like, you know, in a certain sector, it is looking at that need. I, we had a lot of accountants that I've trained. And so they've been, um, over the years, so they've been involved, they've become involved in forensic accounting, they've become involved in family matters, they've done what we call the collaborative law and done that type of thing. So they found what their niche is. I think it is thinking about, okay, saying you want to be a mediator is one thing, what kind of area, where you're going to practice, what kind of gap you're going to fill. Um, a lot of the people we train on the East Coast um, particularly in Sydney, Kelly, come from uh, like regional, regional New South Wales. And I know, you know, a couple of them from different cohorts have set up a business together because one's a social science, one's a lawyer, and they've set up a business because there's a gap. A lot of people need family mediation. The FRC's family relationship centres take too long and the lawyer mediators are too expensive. So they build a niche in there where they charge less. Um, they're also just a gap where they're quicker. They, they, they're going gangbusters. I think they're at Dubbo or Wagga Wagga or, you know, somewhere out there that they're doing really... Because regional, regional Australia like needing doctors, lawyers, they need mediators. So, mm. you know, if you're sitting on the East Coast or the West Coast in Perth or, or Melbourne, it's going to take a while. But once you do break into it, I now know a number of colleagues that are, are private mediators. You asked me this five years ago, I would have said no. East Coast, there's a number of names. My, uh, the mediator of the year last year, our now mutual friend, Tom Sadolka, um, you know, and I know there's a, there's a number of our instructors that work with us are also work, also got private practices. It, it really like is in anything, but you've got to have a plan of where you're wanting to get what yeah. you're trying to achieve. And it, takes, and it takes time and persistence. And like I said, be clear on where you want to go and what you want to do and see what path it's going to work best for you. I just also thought about the Citizen Advice Bureau. They do really good things. Yep. And here in Western Australia, UWA has a you know, pilot program running. So um, I guess it's also really familiarising yourself what, with what is out there because you need to be able to find it. And again, if you don't know, go and ask someone with more experience and say, hey, this is what I want to do. What do you recommend where I would go? So that, that way, it all goes a lot faster than trying to invent a wheel. Another question that kind of adds on to this is, um, can you describe your networking tips, referrals, and promoting FDRP private practice? Um, Lizanne, I met you by Instagram, so could you touch on this too? Yes, so uh, it's a really big question, but I think for me, um, networking I find interesting. So I think pick your uh, things that are actually going to be useful to you. Um, I'm very time poor, I have a young family as well. so. Um, sometimes it's really good to go to networking events, but if everyone is trying to sell something and no one's going to actually, you know, everyone's going to walk away with nothing. Um, but I think in the end of the day, it's all about relationships. We keep, I keep coming back to that because I will not refer to, to someone if I don't know them or trust them. So it's all about building relationships within your industry. And as a private practitioner, I spent a lot of time not getting paid, uh, building my business. So it looks, uh, so it goes with social media, um, you know, being on podcast um, and it's, you don't get paid for those things and it's fine, but, and you have to um, put yourself out there again and ask people, have coffees with people and do things for other people as well. So you can't just be on the take, I guess, create, I create a lot of free value for people. I don't charge for it. Like I put it out on LinkedIn and Instagram and videos. And if people ask me a question, I'm happy to answer it. So it's creating value. Um, and yeah, I think building relationship is the main thing. And it's also seeing who you need to build relationships with. So if you work in family law space, family lawyers are probably um, important to you because they will refer to you. So think about who are the people that are going to refer to you or you're going to refer to them and who you can uh, need to have in your network. And then 
you know, get on the phone, send them an email, have a coffee, things like that. And some events are really, really great, like the mediation conference, for example, uh, Linda, uh, you know, it's great. You meet lots of other people and like-minded people, people you can collaborate with, um, because I also love working with other mediators or people who have exciting projects, because I work in a training space a lot as well, like, um, you can come up with new ideas and maybe do something for each other and say, oh, I'm doing this. But I guess the intention always has to be good. I find if things are just about money, it's not going to sell because people can smell it from a mile away. So I think you have to actually care um, and um, wanting to make a difference. And I feel very fortunate that I do earn my income with it. But that was not the reason I started it. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. And Linda, what about you? I don't network anymore, to be honest, um, but I still get one or two referrals a month. I think I've just been around so long. I, I mean, I think my mine has gone a different way. I, I train so many people now and I'm, I'm sort of in a different space with it. But I know my colleagues, they have done, you know, like I've got a couple of colleagues who are now going bangbusters. Exactly that. They had, um, and there was one particular lady I trained who in, in, in central New South Wales and she saw the gap. She said, how do mediators actually do that? And so she ended up part of her business now is about helping me, other mediators advertise, but it is basically that coming back to what you want. So that if, if you are going to be an FDRP and that, you know, you're in this, in a geographical, you make contact and you with the lawyers, with the referrers. Um, you talk to the FRCs who have the overflow, you, you know, that type of thing. Um, but it is, once you get into the space and you do a couple of good mediations, even if, you know, even if you get referral from the other, I have, I've had a number where I've been, you know, somebody's referred and I've done the mediation and then it's the mediation, then it's the lawyer for the other party who seen me and said, oh, we want you to do it for um, uh, another mediation. So it's once you do it, you get a name as a mediator. Um, but it, yeah, it, but it I is- think that's, but that's, I think that's the crux though, Linda, because you have to do a good job and be ethical because word also gets around very quickly if you don't. I don't know how it's in Brisbane, but well, I could pay this whole place. So I think that's the other thing is to really, and if you, you know, everyone makes mistake, I have mediations that are not perfect. And if there's anything you need to clean up or apologize for, also do that. You know what I mean? So just have a really ethical practice and, and then people know that they can trust you and that you'll do the right thing. I think that really makes a big difference. And you're right. And I mean, look, the mediations that have gone pear-shaped and haven't succeeded with me, um, the best thing you get from that is when both parties say, look, thank you, you did a wonderful job. I knew we wouldn't get any far because of X or Y. And so it's not the mediation that, you know, it, it's basically, it's they can see that you're, uh, impartial that you 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 know and I've had that many a time where I've been thanked even though we didn't you know this has made it clearer for us we know where we stand that's all you can ask for in a mediation yeah. um, you know so yeah but it comes from once you get your foot in the door it's just doing a good job it's, yeah, it's and, and, I, and I totally agree that if you have your foot in the door it just becomes easier and I think that's the difficulty for people because I do a lot of lawyer assist mediation also for legal aid and then people see me do it and then they start referring to me and I train a lot of people as well and the same for you Linda then they meet you I went to a network event the other day and most of the lawyers in the room I trained at Murdoch uh, at mediation so they're like hi so that but that's not where you start so in the beginning no, you're, you have you're, to get that foot yeah you really yeah, have to work and yeah, you've got to plan, you've got to know, you have your, have your, and you've got to connect with the people. You've got to be able to, and as I said, I think what you talked about, your Instagram and podcast, it's looking at what you're going to invest. Because, you know, whether it's time, you know, money, yes, but time, you know, okay, I have to give up a day, a week to do my marketing. Okay, that's a day you're not going to get paid, but it's a day that's going to maybe be fruitful in two months' time. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and also don't give up. Like I think sometimes people give up a bit quickly. Um, so the, the way I did it for anyone who's starting out is that I worked for Relationships Australia three days a week in the beginning and I only did my practice one day a week. So I had an income and I had, of course, permission from RA to do that. So you have to be open and honest about these things and make sure there's no conflict of interest. And then when at one point I was at the point that my day filled up and at one point I dropped another day and I had two days in my own practice and, and, you know, so I didn't just drop everything and went, okay, I'm going all out. So I built it up over time until I was full time in my own business. And then a training expert came into it. And now it's consulting and it's sort of 
got gross. So um, just start somewhere and just don't give up and build it over time. And uh, you per that, 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 that's the thing that we do tell, and this is for FDRPs, Kelly, this is not so much for general mediators, but for FDRPs, I encourage them all to go to a place like uh, Relationships Australia, Centre Care, UniFam, Interrelate, there's numerous ones around, and work for them. And most of them want you only part-time. They don't, you know, full-time is something they don't want a lot of. And if you ask every coach that, well, that you, you, that I have on the FDRP program at the College of Law, um, I would say the majority started at Relationship Australia. A couple might have started at Catholic Care or Centre Care, but all of us will say the same thing. And that includes myself, that includes um, the wonderful Helen Jarvis, who does it down there, uh, includes, you know, the Bobby Rileys, includes all of the ones that we deal with. Um, the lovely, the new one over, uh, Maria Slight, who was, you know, she was in the Telephone Dispute Resolution Service. We've all started there. And that's the good way of not only getting network, but it's a really good secure way to hone your craft is mm -hmm. to, you know, you've, but you've got that in a safe environment. You've got that. And, that, and they allow you, they know uh, that people are going to move and come and go because they pay terribly. Um, so, <laughs> and they know that. Um, so it's like, you know, they, and, and, but it's always, I've, I've had involvement with Relationship Australia since 1993 in every kind of capacity. I still go back or train or go in and be a telephone dispute resolution. Oh, and it's person. wonderful. Like the peer group discussions. Like I worked for Anglicare when I started and I had to bring every single case to a meeting with more experienced practitioners. The amount of things I learned, I couldn't have paid for. And I got paid badly, but I got paid while I was learning. Exactly. You know, perfect. Yeah, so that's the way you start. It's a little more difficult in the general practice, but if you've got a plan in general practice, if you're, if you're a lot of people are going saying, look, um, particularly people like I've got had a I've been training a couple of doctors recently who are seeing medico legal, they're already going to get a foot in. So it is about how you get there. 